Executive Suites with WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Welcome to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi. Have you ever heard of FM Global? Well, if you haven't, it's one of the largest companies in Rhode Island. It's on the Fortune 1000 list, and you're actually getting into the Fortune 500. It's in the 500s, and it's actually fourth among the seven Rhode Island companies there uh, on the Fortune uh, 1000 list, bigger actually than Hasbro. So I'm very pleased to be joined today by the new president and CEO of FM Global, Thomas Lawson. Tom, thanks for being here. Thanks, Ted. Thanks for having me. So um, I. I said that partly just to give people a sense, you know, it's, it's the biggest Rhode Island company maybe they haven't heard of because you're not a consumer facing business, but we're going to try to give people a sense of what you do. So let's start right there. What exactly is FM Global's business? What do you do at FM Global? Well, FM Global is a leading property insurer that uh, works with clients to form long-term partnerships to address their risk management objectives through a unique for an insurance company at least, combination of engineering, underwriting, and claims. And that's what we're going to talk about more is that you don't just, it's not, you know, you're not just like a Geico with our car insurance writing the policy and then paying out when there's an accident. You try very hard to help them avoid those accidents, right? Exactly. Yeah. The company was founded in uh, 1835 on the fundamental principle that it was better to prevent a loss than try to recover from one. So it's a timeless business model that uh, is still successful today as it was uh, 180 years ago. And why is the company in Rhode Island? Well, we were founded here. The, uh, back in uh, 1835, as I said, uh, there was a, a textile mill owner who was uh, tired of uh, paying outrageous insurance premiums because he did all the safe things in his textile mill. And so when he couldn't get a deal from his insurance company, he decided to form his own mutual company. And it kind of caught on with his fellow mill owners, and pretty soon uh, the more people came to the club. And over the course of time, it, it grew to over 100 companies. And, uh, but, but it started here in Rhode Island. And then over time, it consolidated into uh, one company, which became FM Global in 1999. Gotcha. So we're so it's really it's been that's maybe part of why the name isn't as familiar to people because the FM Global name is much younger than the company itself. Right. And historically, it was called the Factory Mutual System. So that's where the FM came from. But uh, nothing to do with the radio. Nothing to do with the radio at all. No, <laughs> that you correct. get that a lot. Exactly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and you actually had a problem. I know when MF Global had some scandal, and then people kept getting those letters mixed up. <laughs> right. That that caused some interesting uh, interesting inquiries when, uh, especially when the, you saw the TV coverage of Congress and uh, they talked about MF Global and switched the letters around. So, yeah. <laughs> so we got that all straightened out. Tamp so, that down. That's right, yeah. That's right. So uh, give people a sense now. Obviously, it's it's much bigger than it's in a few uh, mill factories in Rhode Island in the 1830s. Right. How many how how many employees do you have? How much is your revenue? How many? How much are you insuring at this point at FM Global out of Johnston there? Right. FM Global is uh, about 50, 5,300 employees worldwide. 75% um, of our clients are what we call multinational. So they, they're either headquartered in the U.S. or Europe, but they have locations outside their home country. Uh, and our, client, or our employees are multinational as well. About 25% uh, of our clients are, or, I'm sorry, employees are located outside of the U.S. Uh, we write about uh, $5.6 billion in premium, and that's on about $9 trillion in insured value. $9 trillion. Right. I mean, I think the U.S. GDP is like $16 trillion maybe yeah, or something. It's, 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 we're, we're, we're trying to catch them. We're yeah. trying to catch them. <laughs> trying but, to get uh, there. But that's the, the sum total of all of our clients' property and time exposure values is where that number comes so, from. So um, how about the Rhode Island presence for FM Global? You know, we know there's some companies there. The name is here, but not that many of the employees anymore. How big is your presence in this state at this point? We have uh, over 1,000 people here in Rhode Island, uh, both at our corporate headquarters in Johnston as well as our uh, you know, world-class research facility out in West Gloucester, Rhode Island. Which we're going to talk about more. See some of the things you, you set on right. fire down there. Right. Um, so you're still one one thing different from some other insurers. You're commonly owned by your policyholders, unlike some that might be publicly traded on the stock market or whatnot. All of you executives at FM Global always say that's key to your success. What is your argument? Why is being owned by the policyholders so important to FM Global? Well, like you said, FM Global is a mutual company, which means we're owned by our policyholders, which means there's never a conflict between what's best for our owners and best for our clients. If you're a stock company, you have to you know, protect your investors as well as serve your clients, and sometimes there might be a conflict. At FM Global, there's never a conflict because they're the same people. Same folks. Right. Um, so you just took over a CEO I mentioned from, uh, and I always say his name wrong, so I apologize if you're watching Shivan, but <laughs> Shivan Subramanian, and uh, last month. How does it feel to be the CEO? Great. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a been a, it's a huge honor. I mean, it's a great company, a lot of long-term employees, uh, you know, proven business model. 
I've told people that we have a uh, very successful business model. We've got great clients and great people, and my job is not to screw it up. Now, you've worked there for 35 years. Did you expect to become CEO when you joined in 1979? Were you thinking, I have my eye on the corner office right away? Maybe not exactly in the beginning, but along the way. Uh, my wife will tell the story that uh, when we first met, that I told her I was going to be the CEO of this company. and She thought it was very cute. And, uh, <laughs> so actually it came true. But no, I, I started as a field engineer right out of school and did the same visits and consulting visits that our folks do today. So, so um, how, what made you go into insurance? And I, that's a long, you don't see a lot of people staying in the same company for 30 something years, um, even those someone who rise to the top. What made you go into this and what's kept you there? Well, it was interesting. At the time, uh, you know, when I graduated in 1979, it was about finding a job. <laughs> and, and one of the big uh, industries then was the safety industry. So my background was in the safety fire protection field. And a company called uh, FM Global was hiring engineers. So I, uh, it seemed like an interesting place to see a lot of the industry and, and learn about uh, different kinds of business. And so I really worked for the engineering group. The great thing about FM Global is in 35 years, I've worked for one company but had 15 different careers. It gives you an opportunity to move from engineering to uh, the insurance side, work with our research folks in, in several different roles in several different parts of the country. So been a great I also uh, I liked you. You were being asked recently in an interview about uh, becoming CEO and what it, what it takes to succeed as CEO. You said, "quote Collective knowledge is better than individual knowledge." Uh, what did you mean by that? Well, I think uh, one of the things when you first start out in any career, uh, you want to become proficient at your job. You like people to recognize you for what you're able to accomplish, right? But then as you, as you move through your career and become a manager and, and you realize that uh, you're not the smartest person on the planet, sometimes you're not the smartest person in the room. And so it's really good to take advantage of everyone's collective wisdom uh, when you reach a decision. Obviously, as CEO, the buck stops here and you know, sometimes you have to make a decision. But what we found is that, or what I found is that it's great to take advantage of all the smart people around you. Now, uh, under your predecessor, from the time when the FM Global name started in 1999 through uh, the end of his tenure, the revenue at the company really jumped about a billion dollars uh, in 99 to more than five billion dollars today. What drove that growth? Again, the company's been around a long time, so it's not like it was a startup in 1999. Correct. What drove that growth through the 2000s for FM Global? Well, I, I think there are a few things. One, it was the optimum time for our companies to all come together. So in, in the, prior to that, we were actually eh, sometimes competitive. So it became one company, uh, and we gained all those efficiencies. But, but the real advantage to FM Global is the long-term stability. You know, we tend to grow the most when bad things happen. And the reason for that is we offer the same coverages and the same services to our clients the day after the disaster as we did the day before. So whether it was 9-11 or Hurricane Katrina, uh, usually when those things happen, we tend to gain more clients who are, who are who the stability and our willingness to pay claims really appeals to. Now, you know, on the, the flip side of that, people at home will say, well, didn't they have insurance before 9-11 or Katrina? What, you know, what draws them to FM Global after seeing a disaster before their eyes? Well, I think one is the, the financial stability and the willingness to pay claims. You know, as a mutual company, for us, when we pay claims, that's a successful meeting of our promise to pay our, our owners, right? Uh, but the other part is our ability to help them prevent the loss or at least minimize the damage. Obviously, you, you couldn't you know, prevent the disaster that occurred on 9-11, or you can't prevent a hurricane. But you can protect against the damage, and you can minimize the disruption. And, and our real focus at FM Global is working with our clients to make them more resilient, because resilient essentially is to um, reduce the possibility of a disruption. Or if things are disrupted, you get them back in business as soon as possible. And, and I think our clients are our best proof source. So when, when something happens, like those two disasters I mentioned, uh, the referrals from our clients uh, about their satisfaction really pays off. Pays off. All right, we're going to hear about one of those clients. I'm going to ask you about, you actually have Major League Baseball's insurance. So we're going to talk about that. But first, we're going to take a break. Be sure to stick with us for the rest of this conversation right here on Executive Suite. We'll be back. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi, and we're talking today with Tom Lawson. He's the new president and CEO of FM Global. They're the Johnston-based uh, commercial property insurer that, as I was saying at the top of the show, is now is one of the largest companies in Rhode Island, uh, nearly cracking uh, the Fortune 500 at this point. You're right. Do you, do you have aspirations to get into the 500? I think we, we, we hover around there. We're it's yeah. about the 17th oldest company in that Area. Interesting. Been around a long time. Right? Yeah, you don't see that. You see them coming and going faster right. and faster. So I mentioned before the break, 
Uh, one of your clients that you mentioned on the basic fact sheet is Major League Baseball uses FM Global. What are you insuring against in Major League Baseball? Ster not steroids, I assume, but... Uh, <laughs> No, no. We uh, their property and their uh, uh, business interruption. So, so stadiums, and just like your stadiums, and, and the loss of revenue should something happen to a stadium. Uh, but but our partnership with Major League Baseball is very similar to the rest of our clients. Major League Baseball is interesting and in, interested in making sure their facilities are resilient. They avoid losses. Uh, they do a phenomenal job of uh, protecting their facilities because they want to make sure that the baseball stadiums are open when it's time for baseball. Now, they're, you know, they're hard assets. I'm thinking they're like a stadium or something. Right. But of course, a lot of companies, especially now, more and more, it's, it's technology, it's, it's their intellectual property, things like that. Are you primarily on the hard asset sides of companies, their buildings, their, their, their right. inventories? Or do you also help them with softer assets ensuring that? Uh, both. Uh, we're, we're a property insurance carrier. So it's hard assets, building equipment, stock supplies. Uh, and anything that does damage to those. Uh, at the same time, we consider uh, like data, your electronic data, to be considered property, and we do provide that coverage. We also provide some non-physical coverage, like a computer virus, mm. so denial of access or denial of services. But it's really the property and the time element loss as a result, the loss of revenue or loss of, uh, the loss of profits that would result from a loss. Well, anyone who's watched uh, the news out of Boston this week or this whole winter really can see the loss of uh, revenue. A lot of businesses are affecting this winter as it's gotten worse and worse with uh, flight shut down, pipes freezing, roofs falling in. Uh, how much has it been impacting the businesses that are your clients on the East Coast? Well, I'm sure it's, it's inconvenient, obviously, and it's shut down, but uh, our clients uh, have done a pretty good job of, of protecting against the, the storm. I mean, snow in New England is not a, a new thing. It's not unique. Uh, freezing temperatures aren't either. So they've done a nice job uh, in making sure their roofs were, uh, you know, resilient to collapse or that their sprinkler systems were, you know, properly heated so you don't get cracks piping. That said, you know, they occasionally do happen. But overall, our clients have fared really well in this type of storm. So, so far, do you expect any significant amount of losses coming out of the winter storms we've seen? We haven't seen any yet. Obviously, it's, it's still an early winter. But uh, usually what happens is it's when the disaster or the loss occurs in an area where uh, clients haven't anticipated it. And, and our job is to help our clients assess the exposures that they're up against, anything that can cause a disruption to their facility. And so, uh, for example, we, you know, we, we've covered the, the peril of the winter storm and freezing in New England pretty well. So yeah, our clients point. have responded phenomenally. They're used to it. Um, uh, one of the interesting things about FM Global is you have, we were talking about a disaster simulation campus, basically. And I know it's not its name, in West Greenwich. We try to figure out what can go wrong. We actually have a video of, uh, it's a live dust explosion that you conducted there in the last few years. How much does FM Global invest in this kind of research and these kind of tests? You see there the explosion going up the dust. Mm -hmm. How much do you spend on that? Why is that important? Well, I think it, it, science is a fundamental uh, building block of what our company does. You, we mentioned earlier that you know, we don't use actuaries, we don't look at loss as a foregone conclusion. It's about identifying what the exposures are and preventing those losses. And, and we use science uh, to base our entire company on in our engineering. So essentially we turn si that science that you see in West Gloucester into solutions. And those solutions are the ones that we give our clients. So it's a, it's a huge part of who we are. It's, a, it's the fundamental uh, building block that the company's built on, really. And we've been doing it for you know, close to two centuries. Your burn lab there is two times the size of a football field. That's correct. Why do you need such large amounts of space to do these experiments? Well, we want to do as much full-scale testing. Uh, you do a lot of small scale to, to get the, the parameters. But the real payoff is when you can actually bring a client's actual goods into the facility, set up their storage arrangement, put their sprinkler system over it, and start the fire. And then they say, uh-oh. <laughs> hopefully they say, great. And <laughs> right. Sometimes, you know, it's, it, the key is we want to do it in our lab so it doesn't happen in their facility. Yeah, and it make it kind of vivid there. Right. Um, so what's your, what's your biggest fear as an insurer? What, what keeps you up at night? What's the kind of... Law, obviously, as you said, a winter storm, you know winter storms are coming in, Jerry. What's the kind of things that really concern you or, or are hard to, hard to deal with? Yeah, well, th there should be a lot of things that keep me up at night, but fortunately, I sleep pretty well. <laughs> I mean, we, uh, you know, our clients uh, do a phenomenal job of uh, working really hard to protect their facilities from, from any kinds of loss. And it's our job to uh, really identify whether it's the hurricane or the tornado or the earthquake or the fire or the explosion like you just saw. Uh, obviously, as, as manufacturing and technology evolves, so do the hazards, so do the exposures. And, and our job is really to make sure we can answer our clients' questions before they ask them. 
<laughs> um, so of the many things that can go wrong, snowstorms, tornadoes, earthquakes, natural disasters, fires, what's your biggest concern as an insurer? What does the most damage? Well, I think typically uh, the biggest potential damage might be earthquake, and that's depending a lot on where the, where the amount of uh, aggregation where clients are. Uh, an earthquake's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Uh, plus you get no advanced lead time. <laughs> where at least with flooding or a winter storm or a hurricane, you know, you have time to prepare. Uh, earthquakes, you know, one minute it's not happening and the next minute it is. So it's probably the most, uh, uh, the, the one that gets there the fastest. Yeah, right. you just wake up one morning wake and, and, and shaking. shaking. Right. <laughs> right. 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 All right, we're gonna take another break. When we come back, we're gonna talk a little more about, a little more about the future of FM Global, what their plans are and any advice Tom Lawson has for Rhode Island's new leaders. Stick with us on Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi, and we're talking today with Tom Lawson, President and CEO of FM Global, the fourth largest Rhode Island company on the Fortune 1000 list last year. Uh, Tom, you know, another problem you've mentioned that's a growing concern for insurers like FM Global, you've said is, quote, political uncertainty. Uh, I assume you didn't just mean uh, who's going to win the 2016 election uh, for the White House. What, what do you mean by that? Well, our, our companies, I've mentioned before, are uh, multi mostly multinational. So they operate around the world. And, and one of the issues that is, always comes up is supply chain. And you want to make sure that the countries, as a client that you're going into, you know, are stable and present less risk. So as a result of that, political instability around the world creates the potential exposure. Uh, we've actually uh, just uh, released, getting ready to release a second edition of the FM Global Resiliency Index, which ranked 130 countries around the world on a variety of factors, including political infrastructure give our clients some insight into uh, where they might want to locate their facilities, where they might want to locate their vendors or suppliers. What was first and last on the list last time? Uh, first was uh, Norway, mm -hmm. and last was, on the last time around, was Dominican Republic. Ah, do you think it'll be last again? or? Uh, probably not. Interesting. All right. Keep, keep it up, DR. You're That's getting right. there. <laughs> Are you see, what are you seeing in the overall trends in terms of claims? Are you, you know, I, I admit working in television, you're seeing a lot of disasters, but you don't have a sense, is it getting worse? What does it look like from an insurer's point of view? More claims being filed, more disasters and problems, or is it stable? Well, it's interesting. Like you mentioned, a lot of the uh, coverage is about the natural disasters. Now, the reality is fire is still our client's number one cause of loss. Uh, and, and we've done a lot of work in terms of the frequency of natural disasters. And what we find is the frequency hasn't increased uh, in the last you know, 50 years mm. for tornadoes or hurricanes uh, or earthquakes. Uh, the only one exception to that would be flood. And flood, you know, the water levels are rising and of course more and more uh, manufacturing has moved to coastal areas and more developed land. So that has increased somewhat. But it's, uh, like I mentioned, fire is still the number one cause of loss for our clients. You mentioned rising sea level. Obviously, that makes people think of climate change, too. Is that a, how big a concern is that for insurers going forward? Well, I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of debates on global warming and what's causing climate change, but I think the general consensus is there is a climate change. Or climate change. Uh, what our scientists, and we have, you know, several PhDs, I mentioned our research facility, have studied this a lot and found no connection between all the climate change and the natural catastrophes I mentioned, with the possible exception of flood. Interesting. Um, you're also uh, doing a lot with investing at FM Global because, of course, you have to find somewhere to put all that policyholder money and, and right. keep it safe. Um, what are the challenges of investing that money in a time with interest rates so low, volatility so high in the markets, especially the last couple of years? I mean, is it, has it gotten harder? Well, actually, we're, we're in a great, great space where, as a mutual company, we can take a long-term look at volatility. Uh, so we don't have to worry about share price or any of that. So as a result, we're about 50% uh, invested in equities which is very unique for an insurance company. Most insurance companies would be, you know, significant investment would be in fixed income. As a result of that, uh, we're in a great spot in terms of our investments because of uh, what's happened in the market. Yeah, and been a good time being an equity yeah, investor. Absolutely, right. right. <laughs> um, so you're now, uh, you're looking ahead to 2015, your first year at the CEO. How's business? How's the outlook? How are you feeling about it this yeah, year? Yeah, feeling great. It's a, it's a competitive marketplace. Uh, the insurance industry has uh, very strong balance sheets. Uh, I mentioned, uh, you know, in the past, there's a, uh, it's competitive because there's a lot of insurance capacity. And there's a lot of outside capacity in terms of capital uh, looking for a home. So a lot of the, the uh, institutional investors are looking at insurance as a, as a, as a potential. So that's, uh, that is a market. The good thing about, you know, our clients is they're very long term. 
You know, we, we retain 95, 96% of our clients every year, which is unheard of in the insurance industry. And as a result, uh, our clients are looking for that long-term stability. So while we are competitive, uh, we, we've done a pretty good job in terms of that, and we expect to do so in the future. So we've heard the drumbeat of Rhode Island, bad place to do business, tough place to be a company. Has FM Global ever considered leaving Rhode Island, or uh, why are you still here? Well, I think it was, it's been evaluated, uh, particularly when the companies came together in 99, but the reality is Rhode Island's our home. Uh, we're an expertise-based business, or knowledge-based business. Uh, as a result of that, our, our, our product is really our people, and our people are headquartered in Rhode Island. So uh, we've... Uh, not uh, just our corporate headquarters, but our research facility, and it's a, it's a, we built that in uh, 2003, and so we made a significant investment in Rhode Island, so, so we're here to stay. So, uh, well then, you have all the more interest in the new leadership taking over here in Rhode Island, new governor, uh, new leaders at the State House in other cases, in some cases. Uh, what, any advice for them? Anything as a business leader? What, what would you tell them to focus on as they're all talking about economic development and how to make the place friendly to business? Well, I think that's, that's a key. Uh, you know, first, I congratulate the new governor and just on her new position. But uh, I think one of the challenges that we've seen is the, uh, the business environment from an infrastructure standpoint. Uh, you know, we would like to hire more Rhode Islanders. Our problem is in, in the skilled labor pool, uh, it's been difficult. You know, we still hire a lot from the local universities because Rhode Island is an education, you know, center. We have a, lot of, a lot of talented uh, people coming out of school. But we're really looking, especially in areas of finance and information services, we're looking for more. So anything they could do to make the environment and infrastructure more friendly towards business, whether that be taxes or, or encouraging people to come to Rhode Island. One of our challenges as a company is getting people to actually move to Rhode Island. How so? Uh, it's, uh, well, if you're in different economies around the country, um, you know, you're looking at uh, different tax rates, you're looking at different costs of living, uh, different environment, and so therefore it's been, kind of, it's been somewhat of a challenge. And on the workforce question, um, you know, what sort of people, you mentioned finance, I mean, what sort of skills is FM Global looking for today? What do you advise when, uh, I'm sure you get students asking, what should I major in? What do you tell them? Right. Well, we're looking at, in, in the finance area, we're looking for people with accounting, finance, uh, we obviously do investments. Uh, information technology is, is a huge uh, potential for us. Uh, like, like most companies, we're interested in leveraging that technology and have created a lot of technology specific to loss prevention, but also how we deliver our product. And in the bulk of our information services uh, group is headquartered right here in Rhode Island. So for us, that's a, that's a very popular uh, be a very popular thing to pursue. Only about 30 seconds left. What is the craziest thing you ever set on fire at that West Gloucester campus? Well, that's a tough one. We've burnt <laughs> a lot of things over the time. We've uh, probably, we burnt uh, fully assembled boats, which is interesting. Uh, we burnt teddy bears, which just didn't seem oh, right. sad, yeah. It just didn't seem right. <laughs> uh, but we've burnt, you name it, we've burnt it. If a client <laughs> has it, we burn it up. Right. What sets up the biggest fire? What causes the flames to go highest? Uh, probably things uh, written into flammable or ignitable liquids, uh, things like that usually gets the fire engaged pretty quickly and it's pretty hot. Wow. All right. Well, I've, I, the little boy in me wants to go down there at some point and set something on fire. All right. right. Tom Lawson, thank you so much for being with us, FM Global. And thank you for joining us for this conversation. Remember, you can catch every episode of Executive Suite on WPRI.com. See you back here next week on Executive Suite.